Hey, Adrian. Hey, Zach. Good day, everyone. From Zeppelin headquarters, my name is Adrian Munoz. Thank you for joining us. We'll be kicking this off shortly, so we'll be on mute just for a few more minutes and then we'll go live.
Thank you for joining. We'll be kicking off in about a minute. We're a little past top of the hour. We're going to go ahead and kick this off. Thank you for joining us today for Zeppel's Fall 2020 product preview. My name is Andrew Munoz, and I am on the customer success team. And joining me is Zach Shainsky, our Rockstar Solutions Architect, who will be leading the preview. Uh, just a little housekeeping. Uh, we are recording this session. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to enter those questions in the chat, and we'll get those answered for you. And Zach, let me turn it over to you. Right on. Can you guys hear me? See me? Are we coming in through clearly? You're coming in clear and we can okay. hear you clearly. All right. Welcome everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm not at Zeppel HQ. I am in my home in Portland, Oregon, coming to you guys live, but excited to um, talk to you guys about some new releases that Zeppel uh, and new features that Zeppel has been working on um, so maybe some of you are current Zeppel customers or you've used Zeppel before in the past. Um, we've been working hard, grinding away and, and really delivering some top of the line features and that I'm excited to, to share with you guys here uh, today. So just a little bit of a background. Uh, my name is Zach Shainsky. I'm a solutions architect here at Zeppel. Uh, I've been with the company now for about seven or eight months and it feels like a lifetime um, Elise, um, Elise and Adrian made this slide and I had told them yesterday that I was exploring different ways of making curry during quarantine. So there's a little fun fact about me. Um, the curry came out, came out great. I made a green curry and, and it was delicious, but all, all, all of that aside, um, you know, I'm looking forward to, to talking to you guys a bit more about a few things here on today's call. So what I would like to walk through is one, um, several different use cases that we've seen our customers start to use Zeppel uh, and really start to tackle some real business problems um, on top of the platform. So I've got three different use cases, three different companies that we've been working with queued up here and, and I'll walk through those and, and try to highlight the main points as far as where Zeppel came into play and, and, and how we helped um, these businesses solve some, some real, real business challenges. Um, the next thing is probably what, you know, everyone is most excited for or why you're here is to explore the product and we'll jump into a demo and, and I'm going to focus this demo um, specifically on, on a few key features that we've released. Um, along the way, I might, I might repeat some things that you have already heard or know about in Zeppel, um, but, I, but I really want to highlight, you know, some of the work that we've gone into building out um, custom image support. Um, on-demand resources and our expanded resource sizes that we're providing now. Uh, some, uh, a, a brand new feature around code snippets to make it really easy to share uh, and, and reproduce code very quickly. Um, we've created some new visualizations as well as uh, additional ways to share your notebooks. And at the end of the call, we have a hoodie drawing. So um, out of the people on the phone here, um, all the, the attendees, we will be entered automatically into a drawing where you could win a Zeppel hoodie. So stick around, don't go anywhere. Um, let's talk about a, a, a several use cases. I, I've got three keyed up here for you guys today around marketing analytics, HR recruiting, and uh, credit score predictions. So those definitely sprint, span a breadth of different types of data problems that our, our customers are, are solving. And if 
you or your customers um, are, are solving similar challenges, we'd love to, to talk about you know, any of these wins uh, in more detail. So thinking about marketing analytics to start with, um, you know, we're, we're working with and engaged with a really large home goods manufacturing company. And you can imagine that they have a large marketing department and they're always trying to improve the outcome of their marketing campaigns. And one of the key focuses that they had for this year was around collaboration and making, shortening the gap in the window from uh, outreach uh, to the actual person or, or team, data team that's actually making the decision for who are the right target groups that we need, that we need to target. So they want to shorten that, that feedback cycle. And one of the ways, uh, and, and part of their key goals was around collaboration between teams. So when we first started working with them, they came to us with this challenge that they have. Um, not only do they need to collaborate, but they have um, a lot of different data analysts and data scientists all working on different problem sets in isolated environments. Maybe it's in you know, uh, some cloud resources here, someone's server under their desk, or even just on their laptops at home. Um, so they needed to provide some standardization and, and governance around all of the assets and models that were being built for marketing analytics specifically. So one of the reasons why they ended up choosing Zeppel as the solution was um, the real easy way to collaborate uh, as well as bring all of the work into one SaaS platform so that um, you know anyone on the marketing team still can get access to models that are being built by the data the data science teams and what we ended up uncovering was actually a really large financial challenge that they that they that they have and you know we were not actually expecting to see this but with their current tool sets, they were actually experiencing um, or were able to capture $100 million in, in, in annual savings for money that was being spent on cloud resources that were just ancillary to having to be able to run the predictions for um, their marketing campaigns. So there ended up being this really large financial bill that they were able to recapture and allocate in other places by choosing Zeppel um, and the uh, approach and model that we take uh, you know, that doesn't pass through uh, additional fees from the, the cloud vendor and there's no service fee charge uh, account, uh, accountable with Zeppel. So you can think of Zeppel as delivering one, uh, one bill, which includes all of the services and all of the compute resources that you would need. So you aren't hit with any additional fees. Uh, on top of that. So a really nice use case and a nice win to help with standardization, collaboration um, on, on a centralized tool set that ended up really impacting the, the bottom line uh, for the marketing organization at this company. The second uh, company that, that we are working with was in, in the Midwest is a, is a trucking logistics company. And you know, they, they came to us with this challenge that they have 100% annual employee turnover, if you can believe, for their trucking business specifically. So any trucking uh, truck driver that, that comes to them, they'll get trained up by this, by, by this company, and then they'll leave in the course of a year. And the, um, the business that we were working with came to us with this problem and said, you know, this is a three and a half million dollar uh, pro problem annually for us. And if we can even move the needle by 5% by retainment, um, you know, we'd, we'd be able to save millions of dollars. So what they were able to do was really easily and quickly get standardized on top of Zeppel, um, connect directly into their, their data warehouse uh, that they were using and start to actually build out their first models that take data from all of the um, driving behavior for, for each different type of driver, as well as um, a bunch of uh, feedback that they were getting from employees, different surveys that they were running. And they were able to start to build out different types of pr employee profiles of target uh, drivers that they would want to go after for their recruiting efforts. Um, you know, this was actually really early on in the days of, of data science for this, for this business. And so part of the challenge was bridging the gap between the data team and the business executives because there was a lack of trust in the results and models and predictions that were being built and having a really easy way to publish reports, create notebooks and, 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 and dashboard 
look and feel where you can explain your reports and your code right alongside of the, the analysis that you're doing really went a long way for building trust and building out the program of data science at this company. Um, the, the, third, the third business that I, that I wanted to talk to you guys about was in the financial industry or the fintech industry. This is a large mobile um, pro, uh, payment processing company that we're working with. And their, they, their, their main use case uh, on top of Zeppel was they lacked the right tools to be able to visualize the data that they were working with. Um, on top of their underlying data warehouse. Um, they also had a lot of engineering time that was spent running open source tools and open source software. Uh, and, and, and all of the, the time and effort and money was going towards um, spending or, or was, was being allocated towards internal teams running their tools. Um, and they, they found that they were able to save 50% of their engineers time by moving to a SAP fully SaaS solution like Zeppel, uh, instead of having to roll their own open source Kubernetes clusters and so forth to then ultimately just get to what they wanted to do in the first place was have their most expensive resources, their data scientists and their data analysts actually working on writing code and building out uh, production level models. So that was a big win for them was capturing a huge amount of time savings um, which ultimately, you know, is allowing them to go to market faster, produce their, uh, produce models and, and, and get to, you know, get to market faster with their products. Okay. So again, I'll just reiterate three different companies, all very different, but as, as we've all seen, and I'm sure we've all seen on this call, everyone has data and everyone needs to make sense of it. And we're starting to see this kind of emergence of, data analysts becoming data scientists, starting to explore different programming languages and needing additional tools and having the SaaS based approach that's fully managed with one bill that gets delivered becomes a really strong, attractive way uh, for teams to get up and running quickly that are maybe just exploring data science or to scale across really large teams uh, and, and bring them all into a centralized govern, govern, governance uh, model. And if there's any questions about those use cases or want to dig in further for maybe exploring some of your own customers or your own use cases, we'd, we'd, we'd love to explore that uh, with you after the call. Now, let's get into the exciting stuff. So this is uh, where I'll actually show you guys the product. I'm not going to go through an entire full demo because what I want to highlight is some of these main uh, new features that we've been working on that are really driving a lot of value uh, and productivity increase for um, just, you know, our, our end users. So the first one that I'll, that I'll talk to you about is, is called custom images or what we've called custom images. So you're probably all familiar with the different libraries or different programming languages that your team uses. And it's a challenge to be able to actually bring um, or, or package together all of the libraries in the specific versions, the environment variables that you need in order so that anyone can run your code, right? Of course, there's Docker containers and images that, that come from, from those, but you know, the, the second question to that problem is what happens when someone who maybe isn't Docker savvy or image savvy to actually be able to click run and, and have, your, have your code execute without, without problems? That's the problem that, that we aim to, to solve there with custom images. So I'll show you what we've delivered and, and talk a little bit about what's, what's coming in the future as well. We've expanded our, our scalable resources to support 128, 256 gigabytes. And remember, these are containers, individual isolated containers that are really dedicated to whatever, um, whatever you're running inside of your notebook. Uh, and each notebook will be allocated and guaranteed that level of resource on demand. Okay. So we, we, you know, we've, we found that increasing those sizes has really helped our customers scale. Um, I'll talk about, you know, one, one other major feature that it has in my own personal use, I think really helped is, is within uh, something that we were calling code snippets, reusable, shareable code for the most popular functions or paragraphs that you might be using inside of your notebook. I'll dive into those. And then there's a few others that I'll share with you along the way around visualizations and uh, publishing notebooks. 
Okay. And I'm going to go, I'll, I'll stop sharing here and bring up my screen. And if there's any questions, please feel free to drop those into the Q and A or into the chat window. All right. Okay, so the first thing that I want to share with you guys is around our, our resources and our custom images. So we've expanded the resource sizes per container to allow you to support up to 256 and 128 gigabytes of, of usable memory. And so inside of our resource settings, um, if you want to get access to this, before, you know, what you're probably familiar with if you're using Zeppel is that we would, our largest uh, resource size was a 2X large or a 64 gigabyte resource, right? This was really useful uh, at the time for our largest customers, but they, you know, we've since been pushing the envelope and now, you know, recognize that there's some larger data sets that you might want to work with and um, having that additional memory uh, footprint is, is really valuable. Um, just to drill in really quickly, you, as a user, you get the ability to create your own resources. So we'll give you some out of the box resources pre-built. Um, but the nice part or the reason why you might want to actually build your own resources is around um, usability for different types of users. So something to think about would be, um, you know, maybe I have a really large resource that I want to provide and make available to specific types of users, maybe my power users. But I also have a different type of user that is more of the consumer or the analyst type where they only need to have a, a small amount of data in, in working memory. Um, you can go ahead and, and set the permissions on a specific resource so that um, maybe the data, uh, the data science team we need to have a specific set of, 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 of resources that you can allocate. So I just wanted to show that, you know, all of our permissions are built in here into the, the resource settings. And then ultimately, um, the, 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 the last um, dial or knob that you can turn when you're building your own resources is think about how long do I want this container to run um, until it shuts down automatically. And so we have an idle shutdown time that you can set and you can see um, you can set that to be as small as one minute. So maybe for scheduled jobs um, that you have or scheduled notebooks, you can have a specific resource for those that um, spins up and spins down after one, one minute uh, of, of, of idle runtime. Or you can set this max to be really large to say, you know, if you are the type of, of user that, that you want to have your containers running for a longer period of time to keep all of your data in working memory, um, that's another option as well. Okay, so highly recommend you exploring the different uh, resource sizes and create your own resources to um, be set up for the right uh, teams as well as the right shutdown shutdown period. All right. Now, the next thing that um, ties into uh, our all of our containers besides resources is our custom images. So. We've talked, about, um, we've talked about custom images a little bit here already on the call, but what I want to call out is you're probably familiar with our general purpose images that, that, we've, ha that, we've, that we've had in the product um, basically since day one. The idea behind these images is that we've provided out of the box um, libraries with specific versions that are most common for, for data science as well as our data sources. So things like Google BigQuery, Snowflake drivers, uh, NumPy, Pandas, and so forth, Scikit-learn are all pre-packaged in this general purpose image where we support Spark 2.2 or Spark 2.3 and as well as you know, TensorFlow. Um, and you can see that these images get built for multiple languages. So Python 2, Python 3, as well as R 3.6 and uh, Spark 2.2.3 or 2.3 or 2.4 on our latest images, okay? So with that, with that concept in mind, um, the challenge that, that was posed by our, by our users was, we have 
uh, are we have a, a, um, a specific type of model or specific type of library that we're working with. And we want to be able to create one packaged image that every user can use and take advantage of attached to any notebook that, that you might be building on the fly and have access to the right libraries for whatever uh, model that, that we're building. And you know, the actual customer that came to us with the requirements was working on natural language processing. And so there was a specific subset of libraries for NLP that they wanted to bundle together and make an NLP uh, general purpose image for all of their users. So what we ended up creating was a SaaS based image builder where we simplify all of the actions that you would need to do as a user to load and install um, Python, R or Spark libraries. And so you can see here, we've got a little tool tip to show how the, the format or the structure is. And all you have to do is install your libraries here. We use pip on the back end um, and you can include multiple languages as well as different versions of um, these different languages for whatever it is or ever packages and libraries are that you need. Simultaneously, you might have system and environment variables that need to be set. And so um, on the back end, we're running Linux container uh, and you can set those as well inside the images. All right. The final thing that I'll call out is you'll see that there's a few failed jobs here. Um, you know, naturally things don't always build properly. Um, maybe there's some race condition between different, uh, different library versions. Um, but you always have the ability to download the, the, the log output so that we will we'll tell you exactly where things went wrong so that you can change them and update it. So you aren't just living in this, this uh, black box world where you send us information and we don't give you anything back. Okay. Now let's take both of those concepts, resources and, and custom images, and let's talk through where those actually get built out and selected by the user. Um, inside of my environment here, I've got a, a number of different spaces. Spaces are a way to group together different notebooks if you aren't familiar with those. And it's sort of like, you can think of it like a file structure. Um, this file structure here, I've got my machine learning experiments um, all within one space. These are different, different demos that I, that I generally walk through, um, but they're also, you know, some are different predictions, different models I'm building or EDA exploration uh, and visualizations. Um, I'm gonna drill down on one of these here and let's look at the, the city bike demo that I, that, I, that I built out. So I was exploring, um, I was exploring the city bike data set, which is a, an open data set here. Um, that you can use in order to look at who's using what bikes in New York City for a shared bike, sh uh, for a bike share service. And whenever I want to actually run this notebook, the resources that I get to choose are all, all show up here within the, the notebook settings. So you can see that I've got my larger resources. I can easily attach these. Um, on the fly and then simultaneously all of the images that, that we had just discussed um, can be selected here. So, um, you know, if I wanted to select a very specific image for my container to run, um, here's the, you know, th this, this is how you would actually do that. This is where this manifests for the specific users to, to take advantage of those things. Let me take a breath. And there's one more thing I want to call out about resources and images and why the approach that we took is really valuable. Think of um, when you build a container or when you build an image or you build a cluster on a typical uh, legacy system where you um, define everything and then you spin up a node, right? When you, when you do that, you, you, you tend to have all of these, uh, all of these settings are fixed. So you have a fixed amount of memory uh, on, your, on, your, on your server you have a, or, or laptop, you have a, a, a set of libraries that you, that you load in and you attach to an environment variables that you attach to a very specific, say, cluster. Um, the nice part about Zeppel's approach here is that you're able to interchange these um, as, you know, a, a, as you need to on the fly. And so the containers are really lightweight. They spin up quickly and spin down. Um, and you're able to attach different images without having to change any code at all um, within side of your notebook. 
And lastly, that, that lends itself to be a really cost-effective model where you only get charged for the resources that you need and the resources that you use. So we spin up containers, you get charged when you spin, they, they spin down automatically and then you, you aren't get char getting, getting charged for um, you know, costs incurred that, that you might otherwise when you spin up uh, clusters or nodes that, that are running uh, all the time. Okay. All right. So that's custom images, resources. The third major feature that I want to walk you guys through that has been a joy to work with for me um, has been code snippets. So in order to demonstrate that, um, I have a, another notebook here that was more around a, a financial analysis that we were doing, trying to detect uh, fraudulent behavior um, inside of a transactional data set. Um, I'm going to go ahead and, and select the default view here. So what is a code snippet? Um, a code snippet is a reproducible function or a block of code and text that you have in any paragraph um, that you might want to reuse or reproduce or share with another user. So here is a bank of all the code snippets that um, I've created or that, that my organization has created for different users. And how does this, how does this work? So let's take one uh, around, maybe I've got um, a Python data set or I want to use Python in my data set as in Snowflake. So I built out a code snippet that gives you all of the code that you need with samples and um, information as, as far as how to actually uh, create that, um, you know, make, make, make a query into Snowflake using Python. We have some metadata here around um, what interpreter was used, who actually created this, this code snippet. And then, you know, ultimately in the future, you'll see things like the output of the code snippet and what that looks like. So if there's a graph associated with it, um, then you can, then, then you can uh, attach that. So let me go ahead and, and add this here. Uh, let's say maybe, maybe I want to put it at the bottom of the screen. So I'm going to go ahead and, and attach this, this code snippet here. And now, you know, we'll just drop it directly inside of, inside of my notebook. Um, this becomes really valuable, especially as, as you have new users coming onto the platform that maybe are inexperienced or don't know how to do certain things that, um, you know, maybe your power users or people that have been using the product for a long time uh, or using Python for a long time. This helps the new users get up and running really quickly. Um, I've definitely chosen several of my favorite functions that, that we've attached and one of which is a way to generate um, um, H, use HTML inside of Python to actually produce like really nice outputs and really nice reports. So I just wanted to call this out as, you know, another way that you can think of code snippets is actually defining functions of things that you want to do over and over again, that then you can just drop, you know, directly into say, into the top of your notebook um, for anyone to, to run. And then you can call these, these, these functions throughout, throughout your code. Um, and this is, you know, this is a workflow that I've seen work really well. Um, with people that um, will define a lot of different functions or standard functions, drop them into a code snippet and have those be included in any of the notebooks that, that they're using. Okay. Now I've, I've shown you how to add uh, code snippets into your notebooks, but how do you actually create code snippets? So, um, you know, another interesting um, code snippet that I would want to create maybe is how do I produce um, interactive notebooks? Here's one way to do that, creating text boxes, uh, creating drop-down select fields like so. So maybe you know, this would be a good candidate for something that I would wanna produce as an additional code snippet. And so here with inside of the settings for each paragraph, you can select a snippet of code that you wanna use. You can see the outputs um, as well as some of the metadata and we'll call this um, interactive examples. go ahead and create those and then you'll see all of the uh, this this snippet that we just created show up here uh, down below all right 
So I hope that, you know, that gives you guys some, some ideas as far as usability, how to speed up some of the process for getting up and running uh, on, on top of Zeppel, as well as speed up some of the process for, um, you know, some of the, 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 the new users and getting to results as quickly as possible. These are the, the main tenets that, that Zeppel is focusing on is really making that user experience seamless and, and easy to use. All right. Now, I've talked for about 30 minutes straight and my mouth's getting tired. So let me just pause and, and see if, if anyone has any questions, um, any ideas around uh, you know, code snippets, increased on-demand resource sizes, custom images. Any questions from the- Hey, Zach, this is Elise. We got a couple questions in. Sure. So one is um, around the security of, access, of data access. How do we handle um, security for our data sources? Yeah, that's a great question. So security for data sources um, is handled in, in two ways. Um, let me go ahead and drill into one of our data sources over here. Uh, Elise, was the question around um, just data sources in general or maybe a specific data source or- Yeah, just in general. Okay. So Zeppel's built out a secure way to connect to a number of different um, major data platforms. So Snowflake being a data warehouse, BigQuery, uh, SAP HANA, Max, Alibaba Max Compute, as well as connecting directly into Amazon products like S3, or using Athena to query data in S3. Um, we're even expanding to a, a you know, of course we're expanding. <laughs> uh, we're expanding to additional data sources that we commonly see our customers using. The, the benefit to having these data sources is mainly for security. So you can think of, let me grab um, this bike share. So I was talking about the city bike data set that I was working with. Um, in order to create a, a connection into Snowflake, uh, you, need, you need a few parameters, which are around the account, the warehouse, the database, and the schema. And then you always need to have the credentials for access. So the nice thing that, that Zeppel does is we'll take your user's credentials, we'll securely store those and encrypt them. But we won't actually provide any of the logic for what your user gets to access in Snowflake. And you know, we feel like this is a really nice model because we don't want you to have to manage data access in multiple places you should manage it where the data resides. So what we do is we actually pass these credentials through uh, into Snowflake and if you have, or, you know, or, or Redshift or, or what have you, and if you have access to the proper assets in Snowflake, then you'll be able to get that data back. Um, if you, uh, let's say that certain users, uh, let's say that all of your users want to take advantage of this bike share database, um, each user, you'll see that I have entered my username and password here. Uh, if, if I were to share this with Elise, she would have to enter her own username, password, and role in order to authenticate and successfully you know, get access to, to this data set. Um, simultaneously, for some of our data sources, we've implemented single sign-on so that you know, we can support multi-factor authentication and so forth. And you know, this is something that you know, typically you have to create programmatically and build into your clients. Um, and that we, you know, something that we've spent a lot of time on building in here to make sure that it's really easy to get access to your data, especially when you're using uh, SSO providers to govern access. So I hope that explains the, the question and Zeppel's approach to securely accessing data. Um, you know, our main motivation for this credentials field here is to never expose your username or password inside of a notebook in clear text. Good, good question, though. Great. Are there, are there um, not, not for now. If you want to continue on with the demo, that'd be great. Okay. All right. Yeah, so there's, there's two more things that I wanted to touch on. One was around visualizations and some of the expanded visualizations and approaches that we are taking. And then um, sharing and publishing notebooks. And then, you know, I, I think we'll open it up for Q&A and we'll do our, our, our hoodie raffle drawing. So some lucky winner is going to get a hoodie. Excellent. Um, let me go back to this financial, um, no, financial notebook and analysis that I was performing here. Um, 
Visualization. So within inside of your standard Jupyter notebook, uh, you know, you always have the ability to include different visualization libraries like Seaborn or um, Matplotlib and even, you know, Plotly Express, things like that. Um, I've used one called Fulium for different mapping technologies. But what those don't offer, or the, you know, the, those are all really great code-based, uh, code-driven um, visualization engines uh, that commonly take, you know, multiple lines. So a good example of this would be, um, you know, code code like this. Like we're actually just using the data frame group by and histogram function in order to create a, a list of of graphs. Um, to look at, you know, what, what is the skew of my data set? Um, we might have to take, you know, multiple lines of code. You know, the, if you want to set, I, I've had my own experience setting um, X and Y axis labels, adding um, overlays into the graphs, creating titles on the graphs, changing the colors. And some of these paragraphs in order to produce these results um, can get quite lengthy, uh, as you're probably familiar. So in this case, we're just using, um, you know, some basic plotting functions. Where, where Zeppel has taken this is a slightly different direction where we have built in a function called z.show where you pass in a data frame or some data set and all you have to do is call that one function and now you have a clickable interface in order to interact with all these different types of charts. So in this case, I'm visualizing a pie chart of all the different types of transactions um, this charting library um, will give me the ability to, you know, see all the columns in my data set, um, go ahead and drag and drop different, different columns. So let's say I want to see all the types of transactions, the volume of those, and I want to drill down on what percentage of those were, were fraudulent. So if I transfer data, if I transfer money, um, it looks like in our data set, 4% of those, those, that, those money transfers were fraudulent transactions. So there's some interactivity um, and as well as parameterization that is all UI driven um, through our, our z.show function. Now, that's really good for some, you know, I, I think for your, your introductory explorator, exploratory data analysis, um, but an even more robust way to do that is here within our Plotly editor. So Plotly is you know, in a, a, a graphing uh, library and it requires, a, um, it requires a license in order to get access to any of these, these features. And this is something that Zeppel's built in completely free into the platform. And again, all you have to do is call this one function and you get a whole bunch of expanded capabilities around a UI editor for actually building and creating your own graphs. So we've seen this be really useful for not just for the, the data scientists that's doing uh, data exploration, um, just you know, previewing their data, but it's really brought the notebook and the data science elements of using Python, R, or Scala um, directly closer to your analyst users that are maybe more familiar with the UI-driven view of uh, all, you know, taking advantage of, of all these different types of graphs and visualizations. And then again, if you want to interact with any of the data, or columns with inside of your data set, um, you can go ahead and do so just by, by, by dragging and dropping or clicking through um, these, different, uh, you know, these different options. And then again, if you have any transformations that you wanna do, aggregations, filters, all of that can be done um, through the, the, the editor here where you can change colors, add labels, um, all on the fly within uh, our, our charting editor. Okay. So there's an, an enormous amount of uh, capabilities here as far as what you can do with visualizations and how these actually become you know, very interactive with inside of your notebooks. Um, but I wanted to call that out because that's something that, that's new that we've been working on and is you know, an increased value add for users to get up and running quickly and eliminate some of the lengthy code that you'd have to write. Now, the last part of this is, um, how do we share these notebooks? So there's, there's a few different ways that, that we can share notebooks in Zeppel. Um, one is through our access control using the built-in identities that uh, for each user that's provided. And so um, let me just share that with you really quickly. So you can see 
I've given access to different teams, um, data science and data engineering, and I've given different specific levels of access for a given notebook. Now the value, you know, the value of this is as you start to bring users together, um, you're going to want to be able to govern what different users can do with the code that you have or who can see what results and outputs. So you either share with someone or you don't and you can keep things private. Um, or you can give users just view and read only permissions so that people can leave comments directly within the notebook or um, actually just clone and fork the work that you're doing. Or you can even, you know, of course, expand this out to um, you know, additional capabilities like being able to run a notebook or, or collaborate and work on the same notebook at the same time. Now that's really good for the users that are gonna be with inside of the product, but what about the users that are more consuming the reports or consuming the output of the models that you're generating? Um, a nice way to do this is to create a report type view, which cleans up your notebook, hides all the code, everything's still you know, just as interactive as it was before. Um, but now you can share this out in a published type way through a shareable link and actually see for any user or any person that wants to see the, the notebook that you've, that you've generated, an actual really nice clean report style view of all the results um, that, that you've generated so far and maybe you know, the accuracy of the score or the output of whatever model that you've built. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, so uh, a, lot of, a lot of capabilities around and flexibility around how to, excuse me, I'm jumping around here, around how to share your, your, your notebooks both internally uh, and, and externally or with different types of users and consumers. So I'm gonna go ahead and, and stop there. If there's any further questions, please, you know, we can open, we'll open things up here for q and I'll be around for the next 10, 15 minutes. Um, and we'd also love, oh, we have the, the hoodie drawing, great. So. Elise, why don't I turn it back over to you? Merge worldwide team. That. What's that? Yeah, why, why don't I turn it back over to you and then we can do the hoodie drawing. Great. Um, we have a large worldwide team. Are there any limits as far as number of users uh, on the Zuppel platform or that I can share with? I was talking on mute. Yeah, I was going to say. Um, there, there really are no limits to the number of users that you can have on the platform. Um, one of the strong suits of Zeppel is the way that we, um, the way that we actually, that the users can and companies can consume uh, Zeppel. And the way, what, what I mean by that is it's a pay as you go model. So you only get charged for what you use. And for teams that maybe are really large and geographically dispersed, um, you know, what we've seen work really well is to start with, you know, a subset of those users on the platform and then to start, you know, really um, building something meaningful within the notebooks using uh, Zeppel to get meaningful output for, for different models and then um, starting to expand that using link sharing like I showed you or using um, different access controls for different users and starting to expand, um, you know, we, we've seen that uh, expand to, to global companies. Uh, really, really easily. Um, you know, some of the, the use cases that I talked about at the beginning around the large home goods manufacturer, um, they're a massive global company and they have data scientists in um, New York, Ireland, uh, on San Francisco, and I think even in, in Korea as well. So they're all collaborating on the same, the same platform on Zeppel. Great. Um, one other question is, can I import um, my existing Jupyter and Zeppelin notebooks? Yeah, yeah, definitely. You probably have a lot of, whoever asked that question probably has a lot of existing work um, that, you, that, that, that you've done or that individuals have done on their local machines. So you can import um, Jupyter, you can import Zeppelin, you can bring those in from different file shares or um, blob storage like S3. If you have those notebooks um, stored on a Git repository like GitHub, you can import them in bulk, um, you know, from, from GitHub. And so, you know, the, the one thing to think about is how, um, you know, do, do you want to do that as a bulk operation or do you want to do that as kind of a one-off operation for bringing your code uh, into Zeppel to be run and, and managed there? Uh, it's really it's really up to you and um, we can import, you know, any of those uh, file formats. 
Great. And then just um, one final question. Um, I used uh, Zeppel free trial quite a while ago. How is Zeppel priced now? Sure. Uh, yeah, so I'm not sure what the pricing was when you were, were trying out Zeppel, um, but today we have a uh, consumption-based model. And so what that means is um, you only pay for the, um, the, you only pay for runtime when you're actually running a notebook and you don't pay for anything when you're not. So whenever we spin up a container, you'll get to choose the container size. And that container size will determine the uh, amount of credits that we will, that we will charge. And um, when we, you stop running your container, then we stop charging you. So it's, um, you know, it's really a, a pretty flexible cost effective model where you aren't having to pay for large resources that are running all the time, just waiting to service jobs. Um, you only pay when, um, when you're actually running, running those jobs. And there are no, uh, it's just pay as you go. There are no um, user per user per seat charges, correct? Yep. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, no, no, okay. no platform fee or user charges. It's just pay as you go. Just like Great. Excellent. Well, I think that's, um, that's it for the questions. Let me do our little drawing here and see who won the hoodie. Uh, okay, looks like, um, is it Tega or Teja, T-E-G-A? One, so congratulations. Um, I'm gonna send you a chat right now and see if we can get your hoodie size and um, mailing address. So thank you everybody for attending. Anything uh, more you wanna sign off with, Zach? No, I, I think that's it. Thanks everyone for your time. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm obviously really excited about all these new features that we're releasing and I hope that you all are able to take advantage of them um, and yeah, you know, and, and use that uh, productively. Congrats for winning the for winning the hoodie, as well. <laughs> so thanks everybody. Thanks for your time.